PCF8574 GPIO Expander Breakout Module, 8 GPIO P0 through 7, an interrupt out for detecting when an input changes, and three address jumpers A0, 1, and 2 with high and low positions. I have two of these GPIO expanders plugged into each other, sharing the power, ground, and serial clock and data, each one with a different address, and I am using all eight bits on each one to control 16 LEDs in a sequential light chaser. I'm using an Arduino Uno with the I squared C outputs. I'm using input A2 as an interrupt in just from one of the modules, and I'm taking power and ground as well as clock and data into the headers. In order to make the connections a lot simpler, I'm only using one resistor to VCC because I'm only mostly turning on one LED at a time and this is a lot easier to handle. So I'm tapping into one of the headers to take VCC and send it into the breadboard's power strip. The anodes are all going to the power bus and through an individual resistor. I also have this floating cable here plugged into the ground pin on the GPIO expander and I'm going to use that to touch onto various GPIO inputs by touching it to the LED legs and see what happens if I can pull or use interrupts to detect button presses. So this first board has all eight GPIO coming down to this bank of LEDs the second expander board has all of its GPIO coming down to these LEDs. So let's look at the data sheet as well as some test code I brute force put together just to try and get things working, even though it may not be the most elegant solution. So I've got the 8574, not the 8574A, and the only difference apparently is different addressing. So if you have up to eight of the one part number. You can address them all individually on the same I2C bus. And if you wanted even more on the same bus, you could actually get the A version of the chip, which has a different bank of addresses, and you can get that many more. The active low interrupt out is open drain. So looking at the chips block diagram, you've got your eight GPIO pins, power ground, communication clock and data, the interrupt out, and three address select bits. It's got open drain outputs, so to make an output go low, it turns on a FET which connects the port pin straight through to ground, and you can do several milliamps through here syncing this way. But when the port is going to be turned high, the FET that turns this pin high is going through a 100 microamp current source, and so you can't do much with this, and you would have to put a pull-up resistor externally if you want to do anything significant with driving anything active high. So this is intended mostly to be considered an output low driving port. So the best use of this for outputs would be if you want to leave something floating or weakly pulled high, but to really drive it low and sink some current through to turn something on. In order to use the GPIO pin as an input, especially if you are simultaneously using a single pin as both an output and an input, in order to read the input, first you would have to write a 1 to all the pins that you're trying to read, and that will activate the internal weak pull-up, and that will be read through this internal flip-flop, and once a clock occurs, which is when you try to do a read, it gets clocked, data gets transitioned out to Q, so if you just have the weak pull-up, you get a logic high transitioning out to the chip to be read as a high. But otherwise, if you set this as a 1 and get your default pull-up, but you're actually pulling this low with a switch to ground or something, then when it's time to read, the clock on this flip-flop is going to see a zero that you are providing here, so your zero is going to propagate out to Q and get read internally. 
Here's essentially how the addressing works. If you have the 8574 plane version, you follow this address map, and depending which way you set A2, 1, and 0, A6, 5, 4, and 3 are internally fixed as 0, 1, 0, 0, and you just change these lower three bits, and depending on what you have here, the address is going to be between 20 and 27 hex. So if you have two different modules with this same part number, you might set one at 20 hex and the other at 25 hex, and they'll be individually controllable. If you have the A version of the chip, the four internal fixed address bits are going to be 0, 1, 1, 1, and then you get to configure the lower three with external pull-ups or downs, and your address starts at 38 hex and goes up to 3F hex. Eight of this kind of chip, all with their own address being set, eight of the other kind of chip with their own address being set, gives you 16 unique combinations on one bus between the A and the regular part number. They go into a little detail about why they call this a quasi-bidirectional GPIO. From that block diagram, basically there's just a very tiny current source providing a logic high, but a regular FET that can pull low to ground with a bunch of current. So the transistor that goes to the positive rail can be small since it doesn't have to dissipate much power, so the overall part can be small and cost is reduced, etc. And to drive an LED, which seems to be mostly what they are marketing this application for, aside from reading some keypad inputs, to turn on an LED all you need is the internal transistor to ground, Otherwise, in a more traditional port with a totem pole output, you have a transistor to a high or to a low. So it's a push-pull, you don't need any pull-up resistors, and it's good for logic switching. And also because you don't really need to set any special commands and change the port in or out configuration. If you have limited code space, well, this is good for that. You just simply access it without having to set it all up in special ways first. So it's confirmed here that before reading an input, you need to write a 1 to set it as an input. And then, depending if you are leaving this idle to use its internal pull-up, or you're driving it high or low, you'll read the high or low when you want. To use it as an output, if you drive it low, you're using that internal transistor to ground for a strong sync. But if you're driving it high, you end up with just a 100 microamp current source holding the port high. So you either consider that a floating state, or you provide your own external pull-up. So here's the basic I2C setup with an interrupt, and since it's open drain output, the interrupt needs to be pulled high. On the Arduino, you can set the interrupt GPIO input to have an internal pull-up, which is what I've done. Otherwise, the serial clock and data need a pull-up as well. If only one or two I2C devices are on the bus, the value of the clock and data pull-ups can probably vary a lot, but depending on the speed of the bus and how many devices, how much capacitance, what voltage you're running at, so what switching thresholds you have, the value of these pull-up resistors can start to need a little more attention with a value chosen between a certain minimum required and a certain maximum allowed sort of thing. In this case, the modules I'm using have 10k pull-ups on them, and if you actually want to get 8 of these and stack them together, or even 16, you're basically going to have that many 10k resistors in parallel. Every module's serial data is going to have a 10k from that line to VCC. So you got two modules like I do, that's 10k in parallel with 10k, you only have a 5k pull-up. If you put eight of these on, you're going to end up with a 1.25k pull-up, which I think is still okay. And this is a lower speed bus, so it would probably work fine, especially just on the bench. But it's something to think about, especially the more things you stack on to the same bus. You might need to modify some of the boards and take away the pull-up resistors. So this test program uses the 8574 on two different addresses. I have two plugged into the same I2C bus. And all I'm doing is I'm using it as a big 16-channel LED chaser. 
So I'm turning on one output at a time and then shifting that along and then starting over. But I wanted to test for input reading in two different ways, one with the interrupt and one with manual polling. So on my device number one, on address 20 hex, I'm going to set that up to look for an interrupt on any of those eight LEDs detecting an input suddenly being asserted. So while this is driving those eight LEDs, if I force a low on any of those pins, an interrupt will be generated and it will just act as an input while it's still doing the LED pattern in between. On the other device on address 21 hex, device number two is also going to have eight LEDs, but there's no interrupt. So in between each LED being turned on, I'm going to manually configure all eight pins as inputs, read them and see if something is currently being pressed low, and if so, do something, and if not, just keep doing the LED pattern. So with 16 LEDs, I'm using an integer which is 16 bits. So whatever the integer is, being 16 bits, I'm taking the high byte and throwing it out to one device, and I'm taking the low byte and throwing it to the other device, and that's how I can manipulate this integer called LED pattern, make it any combination of highs and lows, and then just separate it out into upper and lower bytes and throw one to one device, one to the other, and that will change my LED pattern. I want only one LED on at a time while it's doing the chase pattern, so an output low will turn the LED on, so I start out with the very first LED, the least significant bit, being zero, and everything else being one. So it's FF, FE. In my setup routine, to use I2C, I'm including the wire library, and then I want to initialize the actual ports with all LEDs off. So I'm writing all ones to the device on address one and address two. For the first device, which is going to have interrupt inputs, I have an interrupt service routine proc procedure, and that's going to get called if pin 2 on the Arduino, which is an input with interrupts and an internal pull-up, has a falling edge. I will call this interrupt service routine. I guess I didn't really need to initialize this LED pattern with FFFE because in my main loop, the first thing I do is reinitialize it. So my main loop really starts by writing this initial position with one LED turned on at the end, and then I cycle through and gradually rotate which LED is going to be on, and when I get to the end of this for loop, after I've gone through the entire LED pattern, I just start the loop over and reset with the first LED on. So my second addressed device is going to be the one that I don't have an interrupt and I'm polling for inputs. So at the beginning of each for loop, I do that procedure, writing all ones to the port to configure them as inputs. And then I create a variable called input data two for channel two by reading all the eight bits in. And then I'm, I don't care which one's on, I just want something to detect any sort of button press. So if any button is pressed, that input's going to be zero. So if what I just read in is not all ones, then something's been pressed, and I just want to generate an arbitrary pattern of lights, and it'll basically jitter up my display. Let's say I was chasing 16 LEDs around and around, and when the LED is in one spot, I assert one of these inputs, well, now I'm going to get this specific pattern on the LEDs, and then it'll just continue on, and things will pipe on out, and then just keep going. But momentarily, I'm going to see this pattern, and I will confirm I've detected a button press. Otherwise, if there was no button press, I just continue on. And here's where I'm stripping out the low byte and the high byte from the overall 16-bit LED pattern integer. So the first time through the loop, I have this pattern with one LED on at the very end, least significant bit, assume no inputs were pressed. The first thing we do is take the lower byte 
throw it out to the unit on address 1, take the high byte, throw it out to the LEDs on address 2, and now it's time to shift the on LED over by 1 to the left, and I want to make sure there's going to be a 1 right here at the beginning, because as I shift left, it's going to leave a trail of zeros. So I start out with all ones and then a zero. I move that zero to the left, but I leave a zero behind me, so I want to force that to a one. And then later I shift again, and then that other one shifts behind it. But now I got a brand new zero, so I want to force a one there. So I am moving the zero along, turning on the lights one by one, and I'm forcing a new one so that everything else is one and keeps getting shifted along over and over. And when I've gone through the whole thing, I start over with this pattern. So after I write the pattern out to the LEDs, I do this shift to the left operation by one bit, and I know I left a zero behind, so then I do a bit set on the integer bit position zero, least significant bit. And by chance, if any of the inputs on that first address device, which is interrupt, had been pressed, then my flag would be set. And what I do is, on that first addressed unit, I just want to set this pattern for the LEDs. And then give it this longer delay, just so we can see this pattern. And then I clear my interrupt flag, and I'm ready to go through the loop and keep going. And if nothing is being pressed, I keep cycling through the LED chase pattern. So all I do if I receive an interrupt, you just want to be in and out of the interrupt as soon as you can. So all I'm doing is setting a flag to say I've been in here. And then later, when I've addressed it, I clear the flag again, waiting for the next interrupt. Configuring the ports as inputs, we just write all ones as the datasheet says. So whichever address I happen to pass in, I want to do unit one or two, all I do is I write all ones to it, and then when I jump back to the main loop, it's ready to be considered an input port, and I can do a read. And here's the process to read. I tell it the address that I want to read from, then I request and read in from that device, and pass that back with the read input as a byte. And that's the program. So I have my grounding wire, which is going to be the equivalent of pressing a switch. These LEDs are address unit number two. So if I ground any of these inputs to press a button, this should be the pulled input, and it should set a certain pattern. And when I release it, it'll stop detecting that I'm pressing a button, and it'll just let the pattern pipe on out. And the pattern is, the four corner LEDs are the ones that are turned on, and it still sees I'm holding a button, so it's still forcing that pattern, and when I release the button, the pattern is just going to shift on out, and the normal pattern will continue. If I do it again, it'll disrupt the pattern, and then pipe it out and keep going. This is bank number one, which is interrupt driven, so if I ground any of these LEDs, I'll get a different pattern, and it'll pause a bit, and then just keep going. So I'm only controlling the LEDs on the first bank. So if the LED, if there happened to be an LED on, on bank two, that'll stay on because I've halted the program. It'll put my pattern here, delay a bit so I can observe it, and know that I triggered an interrupt, and then it'll all continue. So I'll try to do it when there's an LED on here, and it kept it on and did the pattern here, and then resumed after a delay. So that's how to use this particular unit to do inputs and outputs, and how to do pulled or interrupt driven inputs. The program link will be in the description below, and hopefully it'll be of use to someone.